Now we'd like to hear from John Sano, who has been at uh, the CIA working on the issues of intelligence gathering. And he too is here to confirm uh, what we all know, and that is the real enemy of the United States are the mullahs in Tehran, not their main opposition group, the MEK. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, I want to start off by not necessarily repeating anything that my, my uh, I can't call them colleagues because uh, I'm in awe of their, uh, their presence, but a lot of what they said echoes true in, in, in my statements. But in essence, it's, it's become very obvious now that Tehran is increasingly concerned over developments. They're afraid. The Mullahs are now afraid more so now than they have been over the past several years. And it's not because they're afraid of maintaining or protecting their nuclear program. I mean, there's going to be negotiations next week with the UN Security Council plus Germany to talk about this. They're confident. They know they can get through this. They've done it before. What they're really afraid of is the threat to the continued existence of their regime, of their rule. And who poses that biggest threat? It's the MEK. And, and it's twofold, because they know, as well as we all do, what the MEK stands for. It is not a political party looking to ERSA authority to take over the country. It is an organization that stands up for human rights, for a denuclearized Iran, for women's rights, and for protection for all, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom from prosecution. That scares the regime, more so than military force of any opposing nation. It's the internal dissent. And they know that if the United States delists the MEK, that that sends a message, not just to the, to the world, that this has been a farce in terms of designating them as, as a terrorist organization, but it sends an equally strong, if not stronger, message to the people of Iraq that democracy stands for something, that human rights stands for something, and that the future of the country is moving in a positive fashion. It may not happen as quickly as we all would like, but that's the message delisting the MEK will send to the mullahs. That's what they're afraid of. Now, who we've talked a lot on the panel here about you know, information that is being put out there that's completely false. Uh, that, you know, in, in one point several months ago or about almost a year ago, there were statements coming out of, uh, out of the regime that said that the uh, Camp Ashraf harbored uh, female suicide bombers and that there were uh, plots being developed within the camp to bring down U.S. airliners. It's very hard to prove a negative, but we should expect no less from a regime that treats their own people in such a poor fashion, from a, a, a leaders of the country that even deny the Holocaust had ever occurred. So we can expect no less from these type of individuals. But again, they remain very scared. Now, you've also probably seen comments from uh, both Iraqi and, and Iranian uh, news reports that said that they've already discovered some weapons at Camp Ashraf. And I won't go into the details in terms of you know, the inspections that were done, General Phillips did an excellent job in terms of, you know, providing details on the depths to which the U.S. military took to ensure that the camp had been disarmed. Uh, but what I did find interesting was a statement that was made by then uh, uh, 4th Industry Division Commander General Odierno, who's now the U.S. Army Chief of Staff, and he said in a statement released on June 18, 2003, Quote, we have taken all small arms and all heavy equipment. They had about 10,000 small arms, and they had about 2,200 pieces of equipment to include 300 tanks, 250 armored personnel carriers, and about 250 artillery pieces. And we disarmed all of that equipment. Now, again, as other members of the panel have stated, if you're being attacked and you have these secret caches of weapons stored somewhere, you're going to use them to protect yourself. And yes, they have a couple of knives 
and the, the Iraqi government has even commented that, yes, we, our soldiers were attacked with knives. I'm sure we all feel very bad for them over that. Uh, the individual organization that, that is presenting these myths and fallacies and, in fact, is the core to this sort of terrorist-run regime is an organization that I have some experience in dealing with. That's the, the Iranian Ministry of Intelligence and Security. They're not only shrewd and clever, they are evil. I've dealt with them face to face, particularly in the Middle East. And they are a ruthless bunch. And the only thing that they understand is if you are as ruthless or perceived to be more ruthless than they are. They understand force. They will mistake, at every instance, kindness and concern on our part as weakness, as a vulnerability, and they will attempt to exploit that. It is no different now than it was back in 97 when we started to talk to them about their nuclear program, and they said, oh, you know, we've got concerns about the MEK. And the U.S. government, trying to appease them to see if there was an opening, certainly understandable to a degree and within limits, listed the MEK. Again, as the panelists pointed out, for purely political reasons. Now, that was 1997. Here we are, 2012. And it's deja vu all over again. It's happening just as it happened back then. They rattle their sabers. They threaten you know, nuclear proliferation. And they say, well, you know, if, you, if you keep the MEK there. And as was pointed out in the, in the Wall Street Journal article, some diplomats are concerned that if we delist the MEK, that that might anger the, the mullahs in Tehran. I say it's time to make them angry. <laughs> the mullahs need to understand, and the message needs to go not just to them, but to the MOIS, because they're orchestrating this. All these false allegations are being put out there are basically what we call in the intelligence field disinformation. It is very easy to do. I practiced it for decades when I was overseas. It is very easy to plant stories. The cost is minimal. The impact is incredibly large. All you need is one or two, what they call journalistic stringers, to pick up the story. Like this story about finding weapons buried at the camp. I will guarantee you there will be more stories about weapons found in the camp over the next few weeks, and I think as General Phillips and I were talking earlier, all you need to do is bring in a backhoe, dig a ditch, drop a container in there filled with weapons, cover it up, then invite in your camera crews and say, look at what we found. How do you disprove that? Now, they are clever, they are evil, uh, they have good training, they have good experience, but again, they, the MOIS plays to the needs and the desires of the mullahs. The mullahs are not intelligence professionals. They're barely politicians. So what they're going to do is simply put out the word through the MOIS, this is our desire, this is what we want. What is their primary desire? It is to maintain their rule, their autocratic rule. Now, most intelligence organizations in the world separate their authorities from intelligence gathering and law enforcement. In the United States, CIA does intelligence gathering, the FBI is in charge of law enforcement, and there are other agencies as well. But there's a definition and a separation between law enforcement and intelligence collection. Those are merged in the MOIS. And not only do they collect intelligence and put out disinformation, they also kidnap, assassinate, and torture their own people. So what does that tell you about the character and the makeup of a country that will allow that to continue? It's not just the abuses of human rights inside Iran, which is significant. And as Secretary Chavez pointed out, you know, horrific in their treatment of their own people. It is also the way they treat dissidents abroad and not just Iranian dissidents. 
anyone who opposes the regime. So it's important to understand that while the negotiations are very important to the Iranians, to the mullahs, they care less about their nuclear program because they know they'll be able to continue it in some shape or form over the years. And unless there are, and, the, and I agree, the sanctions are working to a degree. But what they're deeply concerned about is maintaining their control. We are again going back to what we did in 1997. We are appeasing a dictatorship. Appeasement does not work with dictators. It never has and it never will. It is time for the United States to finally and resolutely do the right thing. Do not continue to play into the hands of the mullahs. Do not continue to sacrifice the health and lives of the innocent and law-abiding residents of camps Ashraf and Liberty. Do not allow this travesty of justice to continue. Stand up against the Tehran regime. Stand up for the residents of Camp Ashraf and Liberty. And stand up for the MEK. Thank you.